Now we'll see. 
a great start as we worship the Lord today. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much for bringing us here to be able to worship you, to declare your majesty and your glory. Lord God, you are so good and so great, Father, among us. And Lord, I pray as we go through times like this, new, new chapters, new beginnings, we ask, Father, that you would be great even more in our lives. Father, we love you and ask, Father, for you to bless our time today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, good to see you guys. Uh, a few announcements real quick. So just uh, you might want to jot this in your calendar. August the 22nd, uh, Saturday, is our men's breakfast. Uh, so just keep that in mind. I would lo really love to see our men to be able to participate in that and for some of our youth as well. Um, next, after uh, the day after that, uh, on that following Sunday, the 23rd of August, is our members meeting at 4. So uh, mark, make sure you mark your calendars for that. We are going to probably, since we've not been in this situation before, we're going to mark off seats for our members to be able to sit at uh, accordingly within the social distancing guidelines, but also have WebEx available for those that are not able to come. So again, just to keep that in mind, our, uh, our members meeting on the 23rd. Okay, after service today, we are going to have a, a meeting with our uh, children's and youth leaders and teachers. So if you have, if you had taught um, this age group before, and, um, or you have children in this group or, or, or kids in this group, we'd like for you to attend our uh, really quick meeting uh, after service today as we discuss kind of what we are going to do. Uh, and moving forward um, during the school year. Uh, uh, other than that, I want to welcome you guys uh, for to come to church, and uh, I pray that you would be blessed today. Carl? Guys, so glad that everybody's here, and so glad for your faithfulness. Just want to encourage you that in times when nobody's watching, that's when character kicks in, right? So nobody's here to watch you. Fill out your envelope or drop it in the plate. Nobody's here to, to kind of follow you around and make sure that you're, you know, being nice to your neighbors and telling them about the Lord. But, guys, it, it, is, it is our responsibility to give, to go, and to, and to make sure that there's stewardship of our lives. So that's studying God's Word, that is meditating on His Word, and that's putting His Word into action in our lives, right? Without, ladies, you can tell us this. Guys can say all they want to say, but until we start to do something, the promise is pretty empty, right? Yes, honey, I'll take care of the cleaning of windows. Next year, the year after, God wants us to be good stewards of our lives. So, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you lack a little motivation, <laughs> like like me, uh, but but but. But God has done everything for us already. Amen? And what He wants is us to follow His example. I'm not a warrior. I'm too afraid to lose. I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to do. But Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse. Because broken people are exactly who you use. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart. I can face my giants with confidence. You took a shepherd boy and made him a king. So I'm going to trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror because you fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my. 
my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, Jesus. going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Got a question for you, yeah. Amen. Got a question for you. Did God take Daniel aside and give him a chair and a whip and a revolver and teach him how to tame lions? No. Did God take David and bring him over for six or eight weeks and tell him all about being a king? He didn't even teach him how to use the sling. David got that by experience. He got it by, what was it called, David? Application. He was out there with his animals, and he had to defend them, and he learned. That's where God has put us, out there with the animals. We're out there with the wild animals. So the old saying you've heard before, he doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. He doesn't equip. He doesn't call it equip. Sorry. You get the idea. He equips us when he calls us. And he's called us to go and to carry this message. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made for I will see of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire And in darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God, yeah. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so good, with every breath that I am made. I will see of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down. I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after me, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your 
I could tell you a long story about this week. I'm not going to do it, but let me tell you, the words of this song are absolutely true. He is faithful to the end. And let me just say that the end is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. We have no idea of what God has in store for us who have agreed with him that we are desperately lost as sinners. And the only way to be justified, to be able to stand in his presence, is to by faith, through the grace that he gives you as a gift, receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. To confess with our mouth that he is Lord. To believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. That is the truth today, yesterday, forever. That's the truth. That's what you have to hang on to. Almighty God, we come before you this morning so very thankful that we get an opportunity to lift our voices in prayer. So very thankful that you are faithful, that you alone are worthy of all of our praise. And we give it to you this morning. We ask you, Lord God Almighty, to cover Pastor Jackson. 
with your spirit to come. Just bubble up in here, God. That your word would come alive to us today. That we would hear, really in a fresh way, God, the message that you have for us today. That we would trust you. That we would know, God, that that we're not really equipped to do anything. But it's, it's that willingness when you call us. When we hear you and we obey, that's when you pour the equipping out on us. And God, help us to be ready to receive equipping of whatever it is you call us to do this week, this day, this very moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. I'll give you guys just a few seconds. If you want to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 7, verse 17. Acts chapter 7, verse 17. All right. So we've been going through the Defending Your Faith series. This is uh, pretty much the last week as we're going to go through this, and we're going to wrap it up, and we are going to be going through the life of Paul, which is really exciting. So as you guys recall, the book of Acts is the book of transition, right, from law to grace, right, from Jew to Gentile, and this is going to be a transition from really Peter's life to Paul's life, as we're going to be talking about that in the next chapter. But we still have been kind of unpacking how to defend our faith, right? This is week four of Defending Your Faith series. So let's turn, if your Bibles, real quick to Acts chapter 7, verse 17 to 50. As you recall, Stephen is now in the very defensive. He is having to defend his faith in the midst of people who are questioning him, right? In verse 10 of Acts chapter 7 says, But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So my question is, is that how do you defend your faith today? And we've been talking about this for several weeks. Do we firmly believe in Jesus Christ in all aspects of our life, including our minds, our actions, that we can defend it and discuss it amongst people that hold very different views of God or or against God? Right? Our failure is not our faith. Our failure is not being able to articulate and defend our faith. This is kind of the situation we are in as Christians, right? And this very word apologia uh, comes from this word, uh, ap- is, is the word apologetics. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, always being ready to make a defense to anyone, to everyone who's asked you to give an account for the hope that is in you. So as Christians, we are ambassadors for Christ, right? We have similarly to our government, right? Our our, our president selects key people to be his ambassadors. There's an ambassador to this region of the country or this region of the world and this ambassador for that region of the world, right? So they're mere representatives of our country, our president. So similarly, we are ambassadors for Christ. Don't forget that. We are representatives of Christ. So whenever we encounter questions and such where we need to account for our faith and why we believe what we believe, we need to give that account to that person, right? But what makes it more challenging is is that we are in a very defensive stance. There are attacks. There are uh, situations where they almost put Christianity in a corner asking you to recall and testify what you truly believe. And these are those questions. If God exists, why am I in such pain? If God exists, why does he not answer my prayers? If God exists, why does he not keep his promises? If God exists, why do I feel that he is so silent? If God exists, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? If God exists, why is my family all messed up? And we talked about that a little bit, right? If God exists, what hope do I have? And to add to that, these two questions this week, if God exists, why is there oppression in our country, in our our world? If God exists, why do I feel like he cannot forgive me for what I've done? So as we go through the life of Abraham, 
We go through the life of Joseph. We're going to go through the life of Moses, right? So, as we can recall, Abraham was a righteous man. Genesis chapter 12, right? God promised him three things, land, seeds, and blessings. And we see that through and through in the book of of Genesis all the way up to where it is today in the New Testament. And then we see Joseph, who had very dysfunctional family, right? Family members to the point that his brothers sold him, right? And then, but what's great is he had visions, right? He had dreams. He can interpret dreams to the point that God was going to use him to redeem the Israelites, essentially, right? So this week we'll focus on the big Bambino. Who's the big Bambino? Uh, I want you to turn your focus on to our TV, our video screen. See if you know this movie. On the Great Bambino! What? On the Great Bambino! What? On the Great Bambino! What? Who's that? What? I had no idea who they were talking about. What did you say? What, were you born in a barn, man? Yeah, yeah, what planet are you from? But there was no way I could let them know. You never heard of the Sultan of Swat? The Titan of Terror. The Colossus of Clout? The Colossus of Clout. The King of Crash, man. So? I lied. Oh, yeah, the Great Bambino. Of course. I thought you said the Great Bambi. That wimpy deer? Yeah, I guess. Uh, sorry. Check this out. On the Great Bambino! All right. So maybe you guys know this movie, The Sandlot. If you've not watched it, it's a classic. Um, but he talks about the big Bambino as Babe Ruth, right? And so we see a picture of Babe Ruth, if, we, uh, if you know who he is. Uh, how many of you guys collected baseball cards when you were younger, right? Yes, I was one of those guys and football cards and all that stuff. So, the, the, you know, what's great about it is Babe Ruth, right, who is the greatest uh, major league player of all times. But we're talking about somebody different. We're talking about Moses, the big Bambino of the Israelites, right? So we're talking about this guy, and we're going to see this, his, his life uh, unfold. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of chapters about, uh, there's a whole book about Moses. And, you know, we only have a certain time, right? Because uh, you guys got to go home and watch NASCAR and everything. So, uh, so we, we're going to crunch it down and really discuss uh, who, who Moses is. And, 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 and Stephen testifies on who Moses is in Acts chapter 7, verse 17 to 50. I know it's long-winded, okay? Uh, so this is God's word. So if this is God's word, we're gonna, all going to stand up and to read in his reverence the scriptures that God has given us. So I'm going to try to read real quick because I know you guys can't stand very long, but it's okay. All right, Acts chapter 7, verse 17 to 50. But as, as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took the shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learnings of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and in deed. But when he was approaching the age of 40... It entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance uh, for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? 
But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of the Midian, and, and where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in the flames of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and he approached to look more closely. There came to the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. And I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in, e in Egypt, and I have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you out to Egypt. This Moses whom you disown, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God has sent to be both a ruler and deliverer with the help of the angel who had appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise you up a prophet like me, from your brethren. This is the one who was in the, in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking with them in Mount Sinai, who was with our father, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were willing to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who you led out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. And at the time they made a calf and brought the sacrifice of the idol who were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the hosts of heaven. As it was written in the book of prophets, Pro prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it? O house of Israel, you also took along tabernacle of, of Malak and the stars of the god of Rampa in the image which you had made to worship, I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Your fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who had spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it to Joshua upon the disposition of the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. And David found favor in, the God, in God's sight, and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who was built the house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? All right, you may be seated. Whew, that's a lot. That's a lot of verse there. Whew, and we're going to go through every one. Word by word today. So get ready. Did you guys bring dinner? I'm just kidding. All right. So we've been talking about Stephen, who's been put in a situation where he needed to testify, as he is the ambassador of Christ, to testify who and what he believed. Not moreover, he was going to throw it in them because these were God-fearing Jews, supposedly, right, that knew the life of Moses. All their framework and all their life, all their tabernacle life and their, their du priestly duties surrounded the life of Moses. So we're going to go and unpack that a little bit to see that we, as, as Christians, as ambassadors, we need to learn how to defend God's word. And this is what Stephen is doing. He's learning to defend God's word and he's throwing at them. He's sharing with them what God has spoken to him about and that they need to turn their hearts to Christ. So we talked about this for a few weeks, that God is, God's silence is biblical. God is, God's goodness is magnified despite our imperfections. He can use Abraham. He can use Joseph and his family tree, and he could use you in your situation. God is displeased when bad things happen to both good and bad people. God doesn't leave you during the time of your pain and suffering, and he certainly redeems and will not shame you. So now we're in this, uh, this aspect of this long passage of the life of Moses. 
But see, what we find is, is that God hates oppression and desires people to be free from it. If you look around, there are many of those that are oppressed, right? You look, watch, turn on the tube, you'll see many, many of those that are oppressed. And those people in, 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 in Egypt were oppressed for 40 years. So again, as a recap, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the director, right, director of emergency management in Egypt, brought his family of 70 to Egypt by the blessing and was blessed by Pharaoh to, to rule the land. But as we see in verse 17, but as time, the uh, promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, people increased, they multiplied. So out of 70 people, they multiplied to a nation in Egypt. So we find in verse 18, it says, until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of the race and mistreated our fathers. So just as much as there's oppression during that time and period, there's oppression here today, correct? Right? There's oppression in our history. But there are three key events that we need to remember in this passage. Number one, Israel's people increase, as we find in Genesis 15, right, in Egypt. And the new Pharaoh did not know about Joseph's people. As a result, the Israelites were oppressed and took shrewd advantage of the race and mistreatment of, our, of their fathers. So it says here in Genesis 15, 13 to 16, see, what's great about this is that God is not surprised with this. God is not surprised. He doesn't linger and say, oh, I missed that final detail. I'm going to go and, you know, have contingency plans set in place. He oversees everything. He's a sovereign God, and we're going to talk about that. But just as, he, as we see in the book of, of, of Exodus, in the life of Moses, if you go back years beforehand in Genesis 15 in the life of Abraham, God promised Abraham such and such was going to happen, right? So it says in verse 13, 13 of Genesis 15, it says, God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to the fathers in peace, and you will be buried at the uh, gold old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet uh, upon us. So it says here, he is a God that oversees everything. He is totally in control. But he promised, as he promised Abraham land, seed, and blessing. He also says, your land, your people will be oppressed. Okay, your people will be oppressed. So the question then is, why then were they in bondage? Does God not hate sin and the results of sin? In other words, if God exists, why did God allow people to suffer? So this very key question is going to be uh, proposed to you as ambassadors of, of, of Christ. They're going to ask you, they're, they're on an offensive. They're going to say, why should I believe God if God did all these things that are bad to the point that people were oppressed? I, would, I could tell you nine out of ten times, they're going to use that automatically to disarm you in your belief as Christians, right? And I want to tell you, I want to speak on the youth a little bit. Okay, we have some that's going to go to college, like Miss Alyssa that's going to college in a few weeks. Last, this next Sunday is her last week with us, all right? So we have people that are from our church that's going to, they're They've graduated high school. They're moving far and beyond. And most often in our institution educational system where it is more contrary and against God, they're going to ask you this very, very key questions. Your professors are going to ask you these very key, uh, key questions as you take your classes and, and get your degree. And they're going to challenge you in this arena. If God, if I believe in God, why then did he cause these people to have harm and in bondage and by the oppressors of their time. So this is a quintessential question that we need to really think about as Christians as we defend our faith. Socrates says this, 
I know you won't believe me, but the highest form of human excellence is to question oneself and others. It's to question, right? But see, questions are, are not necessarily evil because questioning should lead us to reveal that God himself is over us and on, on us in every aspect of our life. See, the world tells you that God is limited. God is in a box. But we, through Scripture, as we study that, we see contrary to that. God is in everything. He foresees everything, right? So, here, we see God's existence and, and being is being challenged. If God exists, why then does God allow people to suffer? Further, if He allows this, God himself is evil. That's what they're thinking. See, if they open that, if they, if they disarm you to the point that it limits you of God, your view of God or who God is, they can also interject that God himself has done all these bad things to me and everyone else. You understand? So we need to really be careful. So how do we respond? How do we respond to this? Well, God gives us free will resulting in actions of both good and evil. Does that make sense? Free will. Free will is the wild card to this. Does that make sense, right? So we need to understand the problem of evil, okay? This argument. And this argument wasn't just made up by me today. It's not made up in this century by Alvin Planiga. It's not made up. It's been, this question has been lurking in the eyes for those that want to disarm Christians and our belief system of God since centuries in the past. So here's the, I want to propose to you, here's the argument for the problems of evil. You have to understand this because it applies in every aspect of your life, especially in academics. So it says here, God is Im impotent, right? Right? He's um, uh, omnipotent, sorry. <laughs> omnipotent, <laughs> my bad. Sorry, Lord, please forgive me. Omnipotent, he's omniscient, and he's morally perfect. So om omnipotence means powerful. Omni is all, and put to, uh, potent is powerful. He's also omniscient. That means science, right? Like omni-science, it's knowledge. He knows everything, and he's morally perfect and good. So here's the, here's the problem. If God exists, then God, if, if, I'm sorry, if God is omnipotent, then God has the power to eliminate evil, right? This is their, their, their thought. If God is omnipotent, then God is able to eliminate evil. If God is omniscient, then God knows when evil exists. If God is morally perfect, then God has the desire to eliminate all evil. So, because there is evil, Evil exists. Therefore, if evil exists and God exists, then not, either God doesn't have the power to eliminate all evil or doesn't know when evil exists or doesn't have the power a desire to eliminate, eliminate evil. Therefore, God doesn't exist. Does that make sense? I know it's a little deep. You're like thinking, what in the world? Okay, I tried to explain this last week, and I know I had some head shaking, and you're, I'm still, I'm still, I know it's really deep. So in, in breaking it down, if they're saying that God is all-powerful, God can do all this, why is there evil? Because there's evil, then they can say, then God potentially doesn't have all the powers. Then God himself is really not God, right? He might be evil himself. So that is the persona of where the agnostics and the atheists come from. They, they're looking at this, this, this problem and use that against you as Christians, you and me as Christians, to disarm us in our belief of Christ's existence. Okay? But because of God's sovereignty, he people and has given people knowledge to defend this very question of Christianity. So I mentioned last week, Alvin Planiga, right? Professor, religious professor in Notre Dame. In our century, he answers it with free will, having the choice of doing good and evil. 
So it's not God that causes evil. God gives man the ability to say to do either do this good or to do this bad, right? So it's man's free will that's doing the bad. It's man's free will that's causing the other people. Does that make sense, right? So what's great about this is that it's not only answered in the 21st century, this question was proposed and answered in the 4th and 5th century by a man named Augustine of Hippo, okay? He doesn't have an hippo. He doesn't work in a zoo, okay? He, his name is Augustine of Hippo, and this is what it says. Augustine of Hippo was the first to develop this term called theodicy, okay? Theodicy, okay? Theo means God, all right? Odyssey. And what it means is it's the vindication of God. So he developed this coined word, and he says here, he rejects the idea that evil exists in itself, instead regarding it as a corruption, free will, of goodness caused by humans' abuse of free will. Does that make sense? Augustine believed in the existence of the physical hell as a punishment for sin, but argued that those who choose to accept the salvation of Christ Jesus will go to heaven. This is the third and this is the fourth and fifth century. So this question was already lurking in. Why do I believe God if all these things, bad things happen to people who are oppressed? You think people are oppressed now? People were oppressed back in the day as well. So he answers that. Moreover, in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas also answered this in a very different way. He was influenced by Augustine, proposed a similar theodicy, a vindication of God, based on the view that God's goodness, that there can be no evil in him. So this another word, so you learn theodicy, that's a word, vindication of God, and this another word called impeccable, impeccability. You're thinking, what, is it like a pecking order? No, it's not a pecking order. It's called impeccable. Impeccable, impeccability of God means that God is not able to sin. There's no bad in him. You see? So he believed that the existence of goodness, goodness allows evil to exist through the faults of human beings. So again, free will. And we find that through our history as Christians, through John Calvin and other theologians that we know, that defends this very question that's being proposed, not in the heyday, but still today. They're using this every day in, in our academic life, especially in life in general. So I'm giving you words and tokens of wisdom to learn how to defend that in, in, in your, in your tes testimony for Christ. So it says here in Proverbs 8, verse 13, it says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. See, this is God. This validates his impeccability to know no evil at all. See, that's the God that we serve. But what happens is, is that people are putting God in a box based on their situation. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It works better because God foresees everything. Zephaniah 8, 17 says, Do not put evil in your hearts against your neighbor, and do not love perjury, for I hate all this. This is the Lord's declaration. That key word declaration, it's a, it's a testimony that God is saying what he is saying. Uh, Psalms 11.5 says, The Lord examines the righteous and the wicked. He hates the lover of violence. You see, you see this, this, this desire for God's holiness there cannot stand in the midst of evil. So how do we respond? Okay, so we, we, we need to know the arguments of the problem of evil because you will be put in that situation. The other thing is that we need to have the same, we need to learn how to play in the same field. Okay, this is a premise and I've kind of hinted it through. We have to understand or at least try to that God is sovereign. What is God's sovereignty? What, it is the same as the lordship of God. God is in sovereign rule over all creation as sovereign. He exercises his rule. This rule is exercised through God's authority as king and judge. Does that make sense? 
He is sovereign control. So when I said, when, when we sin in Christ for whatever reason, right, God doesn't go, oh, man, I didn't think about that, Jackson. Man, I'm going to do something else to help, to help reprieve you. No, he knows it. He knows when you were created before you were even born. Isn't that amazing? God created you. God created the feelings. God created your mind. God created your body. There is no, no blemish. But he knew that you needed a Savior. <laughs> He knew that I needed a Savior. That's why he sent out his secret plan of Christ Jesus to redeem us. That's amazing. This is a love story that far defeats, uh, uh, far, far, far exceeds Hallmark, any Hallmark movies that you've watched. You know, for you guys that watch Hallmark movies. I, I, I never do. I never watch Hallmark movies. Okay. All right. <laughs> so he is the, he's the king. He has Righteous control over everything, every sea creature, every weather, every storm, anything, every every life that that any occurrence that happens within us. So one thing, one thing we have to understand is the divine name Yahweh expressed His sovereign rule over the claims of human kings, such as pharaohs that we were going to go through, because God is is personal. He is total control. He's not impersonal. He is not mechanical. We don't serve a God that just sits there and doesn't do anything. He's not robotic. He's a God that's alive. That's, he's alive in our situation, especially. All right, number two. Okay, I'm going to run through this real quick because we've got some, uh, some passages to read. God has a greater purpose for you and me. God has a greater purpose for you and me. So let's read verse 20, okay, uh, of Acts 7. It says, it was this time that Moses was born. He was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured for three months in his father's home. And after that, he had been set outside. Pharaoh's daughter took him, uh, took him in, nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learnings of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power and words and in deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, something happened in him, right? Something happened to that. He started realizing that those people that are being oppressed, that's my people. That's where I came from. So something lurked in in his life. So, so here we see Moses was rescued from the river Nile, raised up in, in Pharaoh's household. He had many benefits. He had the protection of the Egyptians. He had the academics of the Egyptians. He had the power and the authority. But something happened at an age 40 years old. He started asking questions about his origin, only to find out that his people were slaves and were being mistreated. It was sobering for him. Where is God now, he thought. He took matters in his own hands. He defended and took vengeance and murdered an Egyptian guard. When he saw his people fighting against each other, he con was confronted and accused of murder. So what did he do? He runs away from his problems. He reacted instead of responding up to the Lord of his, of his fathers. Now he's a fugitive in an unknown land with regret and guilt. So even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of trying not to understand or trying to understand the situation, God was going to use Moses and his, his people to accomplish his work. That is the sovereignty of God. God has a plan. Have you ever mentioned this? I think I've shared this before when Joy and I were dating and uh, I had people that, godly men that mentored me at my church. And I asked them, hey, you know what? I'm thinking I really like this girl named Joy Smith. And um, I said, I think I want to propose her. How do I know that this is it? This is the person. And this gentleman said to me, uh, his name is Brad. He said, Jackson, if you are walking with God, if you are reverent, God, not to say you're perfect, if you're reverent, you love God. It's not just one, one dart that you're trying to hit bullseye on a dartboard. When you are walking with God, you throw that dart and you imagine the whole room full of dartboards and it always is going to hit bullseye. And that changed me. I said, okay, I'm going for the kill. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> All right, I'm done. All right, 
Brad, let's go. Come on, I'm ready to go. Uh, <laughs> you see, when you walk with the Lord, when you are assured with Him, when you put Him up superior about anything and everything in your life, even your politics, man, God is going to do so much in your life. Because He has a greater purpose. He has sovereign control over everything, including your life and your situation. Right? Amazing. He's totally in control. So let's read, turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. It's in the Old Testament. Okay? Major prophet section. So many of you guys know this. You probably even have this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, right? But let's read in context to see with the lens of the sovereignty of God, right? So let's read. It starts in verse 4 of Jeremiah 29. It says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So let, just a real real quick recap is, is that Jeremiah is a prophet to the southern kingdom, right? And he tells them, you are going to be, you are going to be, um, what's, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, in bondage for 70 years in the land of Babylon, okay? For seven years, which is common day Iraq, okay? You see how hot that is? You think Texas is hot? Guess what? Iraq is hot, hotter, okay? So I'm going to send you there for 70 years. And I'm going to do something in your life so that when you're ready, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to take hold of you. But he says here, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat from their fruit, take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst, in your diviners, deceive you. And do not listen to the dreamers which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name, and I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord, where seven years have been completed uh, for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill my good works to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you future and hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me where you will search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes. I will gather you from all nations, from all the places which I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Is that a crueling God? No, he's a loving God. See, he's telling them beforehand. Not only that, he's telling them how to live their life. Moreover, he's telling them, I am going to be with you. When you pray, I'm going to answer you. I'm going to be there. He never abandons his people. So when we think of, of the oppressed, when we think of bondage, when we think of those that, are, that, that there is injustice, know that God is sovereign. God has total control of it all. All we are responsible for is our response in declaring him as Lord and to being obedient to Him. Amen. All right, point number three. Whew. Point number three, and I still got a few more pages here. Um, when I started off with my sermons uh, a year plus ago, my sermons were four pages, right? Now they're like 10 pages now. So just stay for another year. They'll be 20 pages. I'm just kidding. All right, okay. So hopefully you guys are not those churches where they throw tomatoes at pastors and stuff. Anyways. For talking too long. Okay, number three. God confronts us with his holiness and glory. God confronts us with his holiness and glory, resulting in repentance. And we will see this. We're going to read just a little bit of this in verse 29 of Acts 7. 
At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of the Midianites, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, so 40 plus 40 is what? 80. The angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flaming uh, of a burning thorny bush. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, there came a voice of the Lord, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac. And Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look, but the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, your flip-flops, right? For the place for which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppressions of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. So he was confronted. He was running from his problems. He was running from the situations at home. The home life just wasn't good. It was no bueno at home, all right? So he comes and runs away, knowing 40 years later, he's 80 years old. God approaches him, and he experiences God not like no other. And we see in the book of Exodus his imperfections, we see his insecurity. But God is still going to use you because, again, he's a sovereign God and he's a sovereign king. So, right, we see Moses run from his problems, his dilemma, his shame, his poor decisions for 40 years. 80 years later, he encounters God. During situations of difficulty, he encounters us and we are to receive him with openness. Because when we receive his holiness, it makes you realize your position in Him, that you are utterly sinful. I am utterly sinful in the presence of God. Only He can declare me clean through Jesus Christ. And that's for all of us. So if you ever think that you got to be perfect for, you, for God to use you, <laughs> no, that's the opposite. That is a lie. God used the broken. God used those that are oppressed. God uses those that have poor situations at home. God uses those people that have family dysfunctionality. God uses those that don't have that. He uses all for His good because of sovereignty, because He has a plan for you, and it has great plans for all of us. So now He turns to His holiness, because this holiness makes us realize where we are in our position. And What's great is he doesn't leave you there. He takes you. He wipes you clean, as white as snow, right? And he cleans, he redeems you. And then we see this redeeming love. So when someone ever asks you, God is such, he's so bad, he's causing me. No, it's the opposite. It's the mere opposite. During situations of difficulty, he encounters us, and we are to receive him with openness. That's when he's speaking. That's when we can hear him more clearly. If you recall 9-11, how many of you guys live, remember where you are, 9-11, right? I was in, in, in school, and I was getting out of my early morning economics class, economics 101, and my friend calls me and says, guess what just happened? Really? So I go in my dorm room, and I watch with my swimmates in t on TV. We didn't have flat screens back then with this big TV, and we shared it, and we're watching just to see what's happened to our country because of evil. But according to Barna Research Group, they said that after 9-11, they saw an increase of church attendance for those that are trying to cope, those that are trying to find answers, those that are trying to find direction on what they need to do as Christians. You see, when we are put in situations, God has our attention, right? We should have His attention and we should be listening to Him as He dictates what, who He is and what He wants to do during the catastrophe that man has done, right? So we're going to go and read Exodus chapter 3. We're going to get the source of Moses' encounter of God. But there's a caveat. The caveat is you place yourself in that situation. Put yourself in the situation of Moses, having run away for 40 years. 40 years later, you're in the desert, in Iraq, not in Texas, Iraq. No AC, no buckies, okay, no ice. 
no special clothing, right? You and your sheep, and you're walking in the desert. See in this lens the sovereignty of God. See in this lens God's love for you. See in this lens God's redemption in you. See in this lens God's plan and purpose for you. So let's read Exodus chapter 3. All right, we're going to read the whole chapter, okay? Actually, starting verse 3. So I just lied there, <laughs> minus verse 1 and 2. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not burned up? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God said to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have given heed to their cries because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up to the land, to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites and the Perizzites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now behold, the, sons of the, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression for which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now. I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they will say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14. Think about this. Circle this. God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am Yahweh. You shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you, me to you. God further said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all. And get Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the afflictions of, of Egypt, the land of the Can Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, I'm sorry, the, Hiv the Hivites and the Jebusites, to the land flowing with milk and honey. And they will pay heed to what you say, and you will, you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, the Lord God of Hebrews has met with us. So now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I will know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch my hand and strike Egypt with all 
my miracles which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will go, he will let you go. I'll grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that you go, you will not go empty handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her, her house articles of silver, articles of gold, clothing, you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. And end there. You see, sometimes God has to take us into that very point of our life where we encounter God and to remind us who He is, that He is a holy God. It's not just God with a a small G. It's a capital G. It's not a God that someone uses to curse. This is God's name. This is Yahweh. Yahweh is has sovereign control over anything and everything in the face of this earth. So know that when you approach God, you're not just approaching some dude with a beach haircut. You're approaching God's holy God that sacrificed himself for us, for you and me today, so we may have life. The price that he's paid for you and me. And it doesn't end there. He has more promises to come. It doesn't end there in your situation. He has more to give. He has more to reveal in you more than anything. It doesn't stop when you retire. Oh, that's it. I'm done. Or it doesn't stop when the kids leave the house. But they keep coming back, right? That's God's blessing. They keep coming back. Put you on edge <laughs> so that you can trust in Him, right? To know that God loves you. So here's the take back. Whenever you encounter these things in life, when you encounter God, this is the thing for you to think about. This is a little heads up in my personal lesson. Number one, don't miss it. Don't miss it. You got to read God's word. You got to have Bible study. You got to pray. That's that's what we have fellowship. You have to have fellowship. That's the name of our church, fellowship. Okay? All right? Not 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 just fist bump, okay? Fellowship. Doing life together. Praying for one another. Making yourself available. Inviting people to have lunch or dinner. To get to know each other. So don't miss it. Number two, listen to his voice. Listen to God's voice. John 10 says, the sheep know my voice. See, the sheep doesn't know the hired hand's voice. The sheep knows the true shepherd the everlasting shepherd, the faithful shepherd's voice, right? So we need to come to him to listen to his voice. Number three, be obedient to his calling and mission. Be obedient to his calling and mission. If you love me, keep my commandments. Be obedient. Do what is right. Do what is good. Cling to what is good. Number four, it's going to be hard. It's going to be impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So if you're ever in those predicament, think of that. Number four. I'm sorry, one, two, three, four. Enjoy the ride. Count your blessings, not your cursing. Count your blessings. The mere fact that we live in the greatest country ever. The mere fact that you could, in this country, you can be whatever you want. You can run for office. You can get any degree that you can get. No one is stopping you. Right? Well, you can open a business. You don't have to worry when you call the, sh the, the if there's somebody that's bad, you're not worried about calling the police. You're protected. Does that make sense? You have every opportunity. You can go and worship a church. If you don't like that church, go to the other church. As long as you go to church, right? And have fellowship and have worship with God. We live in a country where Bibles are everywhere. And if you can't go to the store, there's a great app called Amazon. 
that will deliver to your house. And if you order enough, you get bonus points, even better. How do I know that? I, I, right? Wow. You, we live in a place where if this job doesn't work out, you can go and find another job. And if you can't, there, the government helps us, right, to get you through just for a tiny bit, not to be taken advantage of. Just want to put that out. It's there to help you, to give you a boost so that you can be at a place where you need to be. So you can, right? Man, the blessings that we have. But when we focus on the cursings, we focus on, woe is me. We focus on, why me? Man, your lens, you're not looking at the glory of God. You're not looking at His sovereign control. Your image of God is boxed. You've cornered God into doing the impossible. But He's very possible of doing anything He wants. Number last. Tell people about him. Tell people about him. Testify of his goodness. You see, sometimes we go through difficult times is because he wants to refine you. He wants to test you. But when you walk out of that test, man, you cannot say that God does not exist. God exists. Right? Amazing. So, in closing, I want to pray as we go through this series and end soon. How are you going to defend Christ? We are ambassadors for Christ. I've given you tools, but you've got to believe in it. You've got to live it. Right? That's my challenge for you. You have everyone, young or old, it doesn't matter. We're here for it is no longer you that live, but Christ that lives in you. You're a different. You're a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Amazing. And when this day ends, guess what? Tomorrow is a new day. You could restart, reset button, and it's a new day. Amazing. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you. And thank you so much for this privilege. I'm very blessed to be able to exhort your word to our church, to our my fellow believers, to my brothers and sisters in the Lord, to my wife, to my children. I thank you so much, God. Lord, all that you have done in my life, I pray that people in our church would see, Lord God, that you have done great things in their life. And it's not over. There's still work to be done. We are in a very defensive position in our faith. We are being under attack. When we go to academics, when we go to situations that we're placed in, Lord, help us to remember the very tools you've given us through your word. And so, Lord, I pray that you help us and build us to be more confident in you. Be strong like David that could sling the stone to defeat the giant of his life. Lord, we all have giants. The giant may be fear. The, the giant may be dysfunctionality at home. It might be financial. It might be legal. It might be marital. It might be relational. Lord, whatever it is, it might be our health. Lord, only you can slay that giant. So I ask today that we would have a lens of a sovereign king and a sovereign judge, a sovereign God that sees everything about us, and that we can come to him, we can come to you as your children. Father, we love you. Bless us this day as we enter this world of mission. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is uh, your moment to respond. I'm going to have Pastor Joseph and Joy come up here uh, to be able to pray for you, okay? We all need prayer, right? Amen? I need prayer. <laughs> this is your opportunity for us to come together with you, to pray with you in your journey, in your areas of difficulty, areas of challenges, knowing 
that God is in control. You respond. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, Reckless love of God, yeah. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, Fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God, yeah. I felt like I worshiped the Lord today, (laughs) and we should, but it doesn't end here. We need to worship the Lord each and every day, sometimes more than once a day. (laughs) Amen? All right. Well, I want to pray for you guys. Uh, Just a quick reminder again, uh, we have a meeting, children's and youth leaders and teachers. If you have children there, if you've taught before or want to teach, 
We have some uh, announcements about that, so if you can stay over for just a few minutes. Uh, and then next, uh, for Alyssa, uh, she is, her last week is next week, um, so make sure you say hi to her and bye, I guess, but wish her well and to be praying for her as well. And your friend, Joe, your friend is? You guys know Nick. He, too, is going to uh, SFA uh, in two weeks, right? In two weeks. So we need to be praying for him as well. Uh, so if you can come next week, that would be great. So we can send you guys off uh, so well. So let us pray. Lord God, we come before you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your goodness. I pray for youth. We pray for our church, young and old. Lord, you are so good. Help us to think about that. Lord, that you hate evil. Let us hate evil. And Lord, let us come to your goodness and to be able to share your goodness to those around us. Father, we love you and give you thanks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Holy, overwhelming, ever